So I'm Kevin Cody, and I'm here to talk about mobile application privacy and analytics. So thank you all for joining me. So a little bit about me real quick. Um, like I said, I'm Kevin Cody, at Kev Cody on Twitter. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, United States. And I am a principal application security consultant for a firm called Invisium, or an uh, application security boutique firm. And uh, I lead the OWASP Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania chapter. So if you happen to be in the area, you want to stop, stop by one of our meetings, always welcome. So what we want to cover today are some, um, well, here are the goals and objectives. So we want to talk about why we should care about mobile analytics and privacy specific for our apps, understand how mobile analytics frameworks work, discuss the threats and types of data that are at risk in our applications, break down how we, as in users or bug bounty hunters or internal security folk or auditors or what have you, can actually start to peel back the curtain on the mobile analytics SDKs or uh, runtime environments. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it. So one thing that I like to point out, this is not a clapback at the Cambridge Analytica debacle. Uh, I actually started talking about this prior to that whole thing. So um, if that's what you came here for, I don't have any hot takes on Cambridge Analytica. I think it kind of speaks for itself. But uh, if we want to grab a drink later at the networking event, you might get something out of me. I'm not sure. But I don't have any inside information. Let's just uh, throw that out at the front. So this is what we're trying to avoid, though. If you haven't seen this already, this is the epic rolling dumpster fire. So um, you know, this takes the stationary dumpster fire up a level. So this is what we're trying to, to avoid, right? We have mobile devices with a bunch of sensitive data on it, and uh, we don't want it to turn into the rolling dumpster fire. But uh, I digress. In reality, uh, how many folks in the audience are familiar with Zimperium? They were the folks who, um, anyone remember, um, what was the, the big Android media zero days that were out with the media codex? I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, they're the company who basically founded all of those and wrote the tooling to find the, the, um, the Android zero days for the, the media codex and, and the um, clickless root and all that fun stuff. Well, their chief technology officer at the time started digging into mobile an analytics and advertising at the same time I was developing this content. And he happened to throw out a tweet and I thought it summed up the content best, and he just said, he's digging into the mobile advertising and data analytics, and the more he dug, the less comfortable he felt about having a smartphone. And I think that echoes my sentiment 100%, right? And this is, again, uh, from, from the chief technology officer at the time of um, some serious mobile wizardry. I would just throw it out like that. And uh, he's, this is what he was saying about mobile analytics. So yeah, um, that's kind of where I fall to. So just to kind of gauge a little bit, as far as the folks we have here, are you compliance, auditors, just general InfoSec folk? Raise your hand. OK. Uh, OWASP members and enthusiasts? OK. How about pen testers, bug bounty hunters, pursuers? All right, that's good. Anyone just like, yeah, I don't, you know, don't fall into any bucket or anything, but I just really care about privacy and want to know how this whole thing works? Okay, cool. Well, that's me too. I mean, I probably fall into all of the buckets, but uh, I, I would definitely say I, I just kind of want to know how mobile privacy um, pertains to our, our apps and what we can do about it. So just to be clear, I'm going to focus a lot on analytics, and it does differ from advertising uh, a wee bit. So analytics from Wikipedia is a discovery, interpretation, and communication of meaningful patterns of data, especially uh, areas in which recorded information. Analytics re relies on the simultaneous application of statistics, computer programming, operations, so on and so forth. But let's really talk about it. So this is a screenshot of an analytics uh, dashboard, right? So if you had an analytics uh, engine installed uh, or embedded into an Android application, this is the sort of thing that you would actually see from the business who embedded that, right? So it might be a little bit unclear, but at the top there, you can actually see the, uh, the Java, 
the Java source uh, and the class that uh, this specific uh, SDK is, is embedded to or is looking, uh, drilling down into, you can see the types of devices that are running this application. You can see the operating system, right? So there's a lot of Android there. It will tell you 74% uh, were on Android 4 and, and uh, smaller on Android 5 and still some on Android 2. This is probably a little bit dated, but I wouldn't be surprised if you still saw some of those versions in your application, right? The interesting things are the stuff at the bottom. I'm not sure if you can see that, but that says 11.52 of the devices are rooted. It says that on average, the uh, devices have 7.12 gigabytes of free space available in the application space, which is interesting. Uh, it shows you how much free RAM on average these, these devices have. It tells you how often the application was in focus on that person's device. And uh, how many, what's the percentage that uh, have proximity turned on on their devices. So the first time I saw some of this information, I was a little taken aback. That's a lot of, I wouldn't say personal information, but interesting information that our developers and the, biz the apps that we use have on devices that you might not know right off the bat. Like, oh, I wonder, I, I didn't know they knew how much free space I had on my phone, right? Or how much RAM I have available, right? But, um, you know, what you, when in looking at this, you might, you might see here that up at the top, there is uh, 38,000 uh, uh, non-fatal alerts, and there's 10K users, right? So that's the kind of information that I think I would normally think of, you know, actual kind of debugging information or actual uh, actionable information that I would want to take when a user has a problem and I'm trying to get to the bottom of it or I'm trying to see how many users are going to a certain function or page of my application. So with that said, I want to get real for a moment. There is a legitimate business justification for these analytics applications, right? Um, IT, security, compliance, whoever you probably work for in the organization, um, your role is there for the business. You're there to support the business. Without the business, you wouldn't have a security role. Now, if you're a developer, you probably are a little bit abstracted from this because you're, you're providing more to the bottom line directly. But without clients or customers, we don't have revenues. And without revenues, we don't have a business. And insights, click-throughs, diagnostics, debugging, all of that helps drive the bottom line, drive the business. If you're a security as a service company, that line is probably a little bit more blurred, but most folks work in you know, retail or banking or have a service or have a product, and all of that information really helps drive and get uh, better details on how you can better deliver whatever it is that you're doing as a business to your end users. And analytics is, of course, important uh, if you're trying to strive to provide actionable data, uh, better, better insights into marketing, or better insights into your development team for new products or services or whatnot. So uh, the last thing I'll say in regard to that is I'm probably going to name drop a few analytic services, right? I'm not here to shame any of them. It's a legitimate business. Again, I've, I've just used the last probably three or four slides to show you that. So if you hear me name drop a specific analytic service, it's not because they're bad, it's not because they're doing anything wrong, it's just because I happen to see a lot of analytic services. On average, how many analytic services do you think I see in my consulting days, right? I, I, I consult on application security, specifically mobile apps and I dig into the security, how many on average do you think a normal, say, retail app, how many analytic services do you think they have embedded? Just throw out a number, I don't know. 30. 30's a little high. <laughs> it's in the single digits, but that's, uh, thanks for starting this out. Anyone else? What was that? Three. three. I'd say three or four is actually average, which I was surprised when I first saw that number because you could probably get away with one. They're pretty deeply integrated, right? You might say, okay, well, marketing wants everything in Adobe, so we threw on Adobe on top of, uh, you know, Crashlytics or something like that. Okay, so that's two, but I'm 
not joking, I see on average three or four per application. I've never seen 30, but I have seen in the higher single digits, which still is shocking to me because you pay a lot of money for these services. The licensing isn't cheap. The resources for your application aren't cheap. Your user experience isn't cheap because there's a lot of stuff going on in the background to send this data off, right? Okay, so I've kind of hinted at this so far. How are analytics actually embedded into our application? So usually it's one of two ways, either JavaScript or an actual SDK that's bundled in with our first party app. Um, so if it's JavaScript and we think, uh, if anyone was just here for, for the last talk, we talked about the JavaScript uh, top 10, right? And uh, I'm sure there was a lot of JavaScript being thrown around today. JavaScript is powerful. It's a powerful language, both client side and server side. But if you're embedding third party JavaScript into your first party domain, what can it do? Everything, right? A lot. It can do a lot. If you're not familiar with, with JavaScript and, and what it can do, I would definitely suggest to, to research on that. Obviously, everything that I just showed you can all be done with a little snippet of JavaScript. So it's pretty powerful. Um, and when you go to audit that, how much of that JavaScript is actually dynamically generated and pulled down at runtime versus what you're actually embedding? most likely a very large percentage, if not a, a great majority, um, you know, like 80, 90% of that could be dynamically pulled down at runtime. So you embed, say, 20 lines of JavaScript, and then it starts pulling down, pulling down, pulling down, and all of a sudden, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of lines of JavaScript that are actually being executed. So on the flip side of that, you can embed an SDK. So you get an SDK, it's usually in the form of, uh, you know, whatever native code that you're writing in, or if you're using something like Xamarin or, um, you know, uh, whatever write one type app and deploy it to multiple OSs you're, you decide to use, uh, it can be bundled in that way as well and pulled in as a library. But when it comes down to it, are auditors, compliance, security folks really going further into a testing into that SDK or the JavaScript outside of just getting a certificate of attestation, getting the sign off from procurement, getting the okay, we're all good, our T's are, and C's are signed? Probably not. And if you are, fantastic. But I recommend doing that all of the time for any new, uh, uh, or excuse me, any new analytics engines that are onboarded. And I say that because usually security is not involved when new analytics are pulled in. It's usually a business driver and it's, and it's uh, pulled in due to some you know, business context. And like I said, marketing wants something from uh, Adobe's marketing cloud. They embed a little, uh, you know, few lines of JavaScript and uh, you know, I definitely recommend if you're not familiar with what analytics engines are being used in the applications that you call your own, I definitely suggest you look at it. So when I talk about data that's concerning that I've seen in third party analytics, this is the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Keys, like full on private TLS keys, private um, uh, RSA keys, et cetera. Session IDs, I've seen full HTTPS responses and requests. Log, I mean, that's actually pretty common. If you have, you know, analytics and debugging turned to 11 and uh, you're just kind of getting things sorted out or maybe you're, you're looking at a QA or, or test region app and you don't quite have your feature toggles in place and you accidentally push to prod and all of a sudden you're sending full HTTP requests and responses to a third party. Right, what, do, what, what is unique about HTTP that would be concerning if you were sending full requests and responses to a third party? HTTP is a stateless protocol, so what do we have to have in all of our requests? Exactly, he said credentials, identity of people, session tokens, headers, cookies. If someone can get a session header or cookie, what can they do? Everything. They're you. HTTP doesn't care. HTTP says, is this person who they say they are? 
I'm not a, a stateful protocol. They have everything that, that uh, I was expecting. Yes, they are that person, right? So if you're sending full HTTP requests and responses to a third-party analytics vendor uh, or partner, uh, that could be concerning depending on the security and, and, and how that's done. I've seen GPS coordinates, very, very precise GPS coordinates down to the fifth or sixth decimal pl place sent to third parties. IP addresses, DNS, uh, info, router info, that's, that's pretty common, probably not the most concerning thing. Uh, but of course, if you skip down one, uh, folks heard of this GT, GDPR thing, right? It's a, a little bit concerning when we talk about privacy and, and, and data. Um, well, all of this stuff definitely would fall under that. Of course, PII data and um, just credentials, just plain text, you're doing everything right, you're hashing, you're, you know, uh, encrypting if you have to encrypt for, for, for whatever reason, you're, you're doing everything great, but you have to send the password, or you have to send the credential at some point in time to be validated on the server side, unless you're doing some client side trickery, which is which interesting. We can talk about that at a different time. And when you make that post, you actually sent that to a third party in the clear, and now that's being logged there. And everything you've done to make sure that everything is completely secure and safe and awesome is now also being replicated somewhere else and making everything move. So this was a good exchange on a, uh, one of those popular analytics engines that I said I wouldn't shame. So I, I redacted this, but this is directly from their, uh, their uh, boards and the person's there. So if you Google this, you could probably figure it out, but I'll let you do that. So this person said, what information does this redacted um, analytics engine store about the app when you use their tool? And I'm just going to summarize this, basically saying, at a normal level, we collect app uh, level data, metadata, app name, bundle ID, icon, et cetera, et cetera, so we can uh, distinguish your app within the dashboard. At the crash level, there's a lot more. There are crash reports, right? Um, we're trusted by many of the largest companies, Twitter, Square, et cetera, et cetera, to protect their data. But let me know if you have any specific questions. So just to throw it out there, I think that's probably right, but did they mention any of these things? Because I can tell you, I've seen every single one of these multiple times in real world applications that are out there in the market today. And I, he never mentioned keys, he never mentioned plain text creds, he never mentioned GPS coordinates, PII data, HIPAA data, PCI data, et cetera, et cetera. And I've seen all of that in third-party analytics engines. So what I'm trying to say here is that while this is technically not wrong, depending on how you have it configured, I would say that this is probably not the typical state for these analytics engines. Of course, it can be much less than what he's even saying here, well, outside of probably the first, the first thing, right? They absolutely have to have the uh, app ID, package, bundle name, icon, that kind of thing, right? But, um, I've definitely seen more detail than what is outlined here outside of crash level debug. So you might be thinking, so like, what does Google think about this? Or what does Apple think about this, right? You have these third parties who are collecting all of this information about their users. And you know, there might be a concern that one of the operating systems might say, hey, you're not getting explicit consent from your users to capture all of this data we don't want you to send it to third parties, right? Well, Apple did come out and change their, their uh, legal verbiage. This was back of May of last year. And they said that apps are no longer able to transmit location data of users to third parties. So you think that that would include the analytics engines, but to be clear, it does not. Analytics are exempt from this statement. So because you're embedding the analytics in your first party app, they are considered the first party app. So there is nothing from Apple's point of view or Google's point of view, there is no um, legal issue with sending your user data as verbose as you may want or not want to an analytics firm or a third party. You're expressly, you're expressly embedding that analytics engine into your application, so this uh, gets beyond that. 
So we talk about real world risk. There was a good uh, study done by App Authority. Again, this is released last spring. And they looked at Firebase specifically. Are people familiar with Firebase? Google, they're, they're Google now. Um, so Firebase had a, an interesting issue. Um, there was some type of a debug flag or something. I, I included the link. Uh, this, this article was specifically from Bleeping Computer. Uh, but basically, someone went through applications that utilized Firebase embedded and looked at the security of the cloud control panel for Firebase uh, to see if they were properly um, uh, enforcing authentication on their Firebase instances. And it found that there were several thousand, uh, specifically 28,000 um, uh, applications in total. Most of those were Android 27,000. Some were iOS, a, a fraction of that. Uh, but they they uh, connected and stored data inside the, the uh, Firebase backends. And out of that number of apps, um, 2,271 misconfigured their Firebase instances to allow them to be, un to be viewed from an unauthenticated person. So all of the data that was being stored, again, analytics type data, was completely open to the internet and could be viewed by anyone. You just had to look in the right place. And what's interesting about mobile applications that's different from, say, web applications? Clients have your code in their hands. You can obfuscate it all you want. You've probably heard the, the term spaghetti code or, or code obfuscation, right? You can do whatever you can to try to hide what the actual underlying code is. But with enough time, effort, an attacker would be able to extract where this is coming from. And it's actually pretty easy to see once you proxy the traffic. So when you're looking at your analytics and you want to dig a little bit further, these are some questions that I would recommend you ask. Do all of your analytics engines offer two-factor auth? So I'm talking when you actually go in to view your client's data, your app data in their portal, do they offer 2FA? Because you may offer, you may lock down, you know, YubiKey everywhere. But if your analytics vendors aren't doing this, that's absolutely a place where an attacker is going to focus. Do they offer SSO? and the ability to terminate the access of your users or employees who have access to that remotely on a, whatever your policy is, right? You may do that everywhere across the board, but if they don't offer SSO and they have a static password in the analytics engine uh, uh, portal and they walk out the door today and you cut their access and you move on and then 15 days later they go to access this, this portal and pull down all your data, it's gonna be open unless you know to go in and, and, and uh, uh, terminate that user or unless they do allow SSO support. Another question, does your security audit compliance team even know what analytics engines are actually embedded into your application? And finally, do your analytics engines have a stipulation like, um, do not, as I do use, do not use to log sensitive health, PCI, GDPR, whatever, whatever, whatever. Because if they do, that's basically exonerating them if anything bad were to happen, but most likely um, they're not actually going in and enforcing that, right? They're not looking at the data you're putting in and saying, hey, we don't want you to utilize our service for XYZ data, right? That's a level that they're not going to audit again. So if you're use, using that and they're breached and you say, hey, you were breached, how are you, you know, you were supposed to be protecting our data, they're gonna come back to you and say, hey, you're not supposed to be logging that type of data utilizing our service. Okay, so quickly here, um, I wanna talk about uh, a few things. One, prophylactic measures. If you're a user or abuser and you don't want your information being aggregated by these third parties, you can do a couple different things. One, I would recommend not using federated authentication services for applications. So log in with Facebook, log in with Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. There are some definite security gains for utilizing federated auth, but the aggregation of data and the ability for analytics to start to connect you or an attacker to connect you if there was ever a leak, um, it's, it's a little bit more concerning if you utilize federated auth. Also, uh, you know, just be generally more aware based on what we talked about today that applications outside of maybe the application you thought you were giving express consent to might have your data. 
And one thing you can actually do, it might break something, but if you were really concerned about it, you could try. You could utilize some traffic uh, sinkholing. If you're not familiar with like Pi-hole uh, or special DNS, you could actually either do it on the device itself utilizing a proxy or like a, a, in Android you could uh, modify Etsy host or whatnot, or you could utilize a special DNS server like something like Pi-hole or something. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to hit on really quickly before we wrap things up is if you were a user, abuser, internal security person, what can you do to actually dig in to this and start to see what these third party services are, what type of data they're collecting without actually just going in and logging into the console? Right? So if you want to do that, I'd recommend using Burp or Zap or, or whatnot. Um, a jailbroken or rooted device if possible. Of course, like SSH, SCP, ADB, et cetera. Wireshark or PCAPs. Uh, and then Frida, if you're not familiar with Frida, grab me after this talk, I could talk to you a little bit more about Frida. And uh, objection or code share. And uh, free dump, free dump is the ability to dump memory from, from the device using a Frida script. Um, specifically with Burp, use the, like the JSON Beautifier uh, plugin is always nice. Decompressor, a lot of the analytics will actually compress the payloads uh, using gzip or, or you know just zip. Uh, so decompressor makes things a little bit easier. Of course, filter, search, regex using decoders. Specifically, this is what I wanted to point out. If you are a tester or you're at testing to something, make sure you're not clicking this when Burp throws up, do you want to disregard things that are outside of scope? Because most likely your analytics is not gonna be in the scope of the first party app that you're looking at. So if you go into Burp and check this as under proxy options, do not send items to proxy history or other Burp tools without a scope, make sure that's not clicked or you're gonna completely miss everything that I just talked about. So uh, last few things. So a couple hurdles when you're looking at this, of course, is obfuscation compression, encryption, and knowing what uh, data is sensitive, and just knowing that it's labor intensive to know what data is, is sensitive, right? A scanning tool isn't gonna pick this up. It might flag a, uh, a credit card number, a PAN, it might uh, flag a, a social security number, or driver's license, or a passport, or something like that, but context is king, and only you, the auditor or compliance or pen tester or bug bounty person are really going to be able to look and say, you know what, that is actually sensitive data. So trick of the trade if you're actually trying to map all of this, find all of this, create new accounts, capture the flow of the account creation, use unique names, IDs, emails during that process, that way you can see all of that traffic being generated log out of the application and log back in. Sometimes the analytics engines might uh, kick up when you actually log out and then log back into the application. Authenticate using federated services. Again, I said if you, you're really concerned about it in your personal life, you might not want to use federated services, but if you're trying to test analytics and see what all is logged, use federated services along with local accounts um, and capture device system logs. So, the, so this is the last thing, and I'll open it up for maybe one or two questions if we have time. Um, specifically this morning, I went out and downloaded the top, the is Israeli uh, top 10 apps from the Google Play Store, and I just wanted to give you a couple, uh, I'm not going to say who they were, I'm not going to shame them specifically, but some of the things that I saw being sent to third party analytics firms. Specifically were um, GPS coordinates, my specific GPS, this hotel where I was at, were being sent to third parties outside of the corporations you see under publisher. Um, session tokens, and one sent a clear text password that I created for that account to a third party. So I'll let you take that on your own and, and decide what you want to do. Um, so more people should be looking at this. I'm going to release a few tools and, and a follow-up blog to this. And if you have any questions that are legal, about legal activities, reach out to me. If you want to talk about hacking one of these things, I'm, I'm not your, your contact. Sorry, you'll have to find someone else or hopefully change your, your mind. Thank you to the global AppSec staff, volunteers, attendees, vendors, and all of your families, and for you for coming to speak.